All right, so I'm here with a gentleman by the name of Ace, who lives out in northeast Tassie, not too far from where I'm situated. And uh, he's contacted me only about a couple of weeks ago to let me know that he had a few bits of info that I might be of interest. So, Ace, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate you um, taking the time out to have a chat to me, and thanks for the coffee. No, you're right. Um, Bill's in the mail. <laughs> So tell me a bit about your your up, upbringing. Where, whereabouts did you grow up? You're, you're born and bred Taswegian, yeah. Yeah, I, I was born in Beaconsfield, and I grew up in Launceston. But I spent most of my uh, early childhood and teens and that on the east coast, and at, at Campbelltown. I suppose both my parents come from one come from the east coast, another one come from Campbelltown. So obviously. You know, they go and visit aunts, uncles, whatever, you know. Yep. And, um, of course, my father was a bit of a Daniel Boone. He was quite quite a good hunter, yep. very good shot. And um, most of my relatives were the same. I mean, you know, shoot the ass out of a piss and at a thousand yards or you wasn't fit to have a gun type thing. Yeah, yeah, so you, know? you, you had to be oh, yeah, well-versed yeah. in, in using a firearm. Oh, yes, yes, very gun safe. And... Um, the whole family was, um, and and the in-laws, and that, you know, all the people. Don't, don't mind the logging truck going past, it just adds to the authenticity of where we Yeah, are. no, it's all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll go out later and pinch where he's cutting his wood. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, just in general, spent a lot of time in the bush and with a lot of older folk too, which are, you know, be well over 100 years old now, these people. They're all dead and gone. Yeah. Which is because... My mother and father had me late in life, so... Okay, so your but, parents were a little bit older. Yeah, well, the time I was 20, my father was 60. Okay, yeah. So, so, you know, I got I got to know most of these old fossils and, you know... And you were born in the 1940s? I was born in 1959. 59, sorry, yeah. I don't want to make you any older than what you are. <laughs> <laughs> 1959, okay, so... Yeah. The people that were older people back when you were a kid growing up in the they 60s. They were all born in the 1920s, the people I sort of... Yep, were, that you were like, looking up to. Yeah, yep. the 20s and 30s. Okay. All gone through the depression and, you know, miserable sin, a lot of them. Yep, but yeah. they survived a tough time. Oh, yeah. And then my, lived through a war. My father and... left school in grade two to go rabbiting to feed the family. Yeah, okay. He came from a big family. Yep. At Campbelltown and, yep. you know. Yep, And... And His, they were all on the land back in those days. Well, you were in the bush pretty much. There was no, there was no like a, I think, grand, grandfather's job was basically the the dole of what you worked for. Yep. Because there was no work. Yep. So you got an allowance from the government to get your provisions and stuff, basically, and um, you did work for the council, sort of thing. Yeah, basically, yeah. I, that's what I would have. I mean, they never ever let on because you know they're all pretty proud sort of people. Sure. And my mother's family from the east coast. Yeah. My grandfather he farmed Shooting Island. Okay. Mm. And yeah, there was he had a bit of a hobbyist type farm, and he, his father was pretty well one of the early settlers of Swansea. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So going back a fair way then. Yeah. Yeah. These people were they weren't rich people, but they were go getters. Yeah. I'd say, you know, on on my mother's side, on my father's side, they, they, they'd they started, they'd come from a very good family, but they'd been cast out of it, and so they were a bit more ordinary, I'd say. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, but they, you know, they they all were very good hunters and very good bushmen. Yep. I mean, yeah, you, you, could, you could drive them around circus for a year in the bush and drop them, and they'd walk straight back out. Yeah, sure. So it's almost like that they had a homing device in them. Yep, yeah. they knew the lay of the land. Yeah. I turn around four times and I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to work out where I am again. Yeah. So I know you've had an experience yourself with a, a thyla, but you mentioned earlier that um, some relatives oh, had, yeah, had, yeah. had experiences as well, your father in particular. My father run full butt into one on what they call the Ladies Mile on the Lake Week Road, where my grandfather used to be the road maintenance man of. Okay. And that would have been around about 1928, 1930. Yep. He ran full butt into it on his pedal bike, taking provisions up to his father. At work, basically, taking him up his lunch or something? Or no, he was no, no. Up there? He used to camp away for a fortnight at a time. Oh, yeah, okay. And once a week, Dad would take provisions up to him. 
and he actually crashed into one on his bicycle. Yeah, he ran full butt into it. <laughs> <laughs> Not needless to say, neither him nor the Silas team were very happy about the situation. No doubt. Yeah. But it, him being a very good cyclist at the time, very quick on a bike, um, took to his scrapers. Yep. Went and said to his father, and his fa- father just said, oh, yeah, yeah, there he is. Yep. Just, just, it was just a known thing, and they were quite prevalent everywhere probably in Tasmania at that time yeah 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 well there was still one in the zoo alive wasn't there yeah there was a couple but in 1928 mm. 1930 um, last one died in 1936 mm. um, well supposedly what about the people well, up the, I was very saying the thing there were some people up the back of Ring Room or something made a pet bastard in the 1950s had yeah. a family of pets I, I have heard about that before yeah there was a fellow But of course, was, like everything else, they didn't exist, did they? <laughs> well, yeah, there was a fellow who um, <coughs> made contact with one of the ladies in the group about two years ago who's writing a book, apparently, about his grandmother's pet one hmm. that she had up into the 40s, I think, 50s. So You, you realise that one that died in the Hobart Museum, uh, Hobart Zoo, was a pet of a woman down Hobart, and so was half the animals in the Bay Morris Zoo. They started the Bay Morris Zoo when the woman died because they didn't know what to do with the fucking animals yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I read that in a book here just recently. And it's an old book too. It's not a book that's been written. That was Mary Roberts? I don't know who her name was, but she was some woman in Hobart who had a bit of a fascination with native animals and that. And I'm pretty sure that was who started it all. And they, they the government basically took over. But well, then... she died and they had to do something with all the animals. I mean, she actually had a thylacine and used to walk around the front yard like a dog. Yeah, there's there's a few stories that um, people Dr. used to go and pay money to go and have a look at them all. In Bob Paddle's book, he he found a few stories of people keeping them as pets, but mm. the, it's also in the Aboriginal literature as well. Yeah, some culture. Aboriginals kept them as pets, and some ad- Aboriginals probably put them on the spit. <laughs> yeah, well, in Tassie that definitely happened, but mm. also in Northern Territory they kept them as pets as mm. hunting companions. So there would have been other groups, no doubt, around the mainland that had them as companions well, as well. The first one I seen, I can honestly say they're no they're no one's fool. They're a very intelligent animal. Mm. Consider, I would say I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I would say that they almost had the intelligence of the natives of the town of the place. Yeah, yeah, like they, they fellows they, knew the lay of the land very well, and so did they. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, for for an animal, they're very switched on. They've. Um, become very elusive I think and and probably by the time the bounty ended and they were finally given protection a lot of the dumb ones would have been the first ones to get trapped and the the, the remaining gene pool was probably quite smart well it's a bit like roadkill here in Tasmania now I mean I've seen you've got the idiot kangaroo that comes out of the bush and he's lived in the bush all his life and comes bound and out and gets cleaned up but then you see it Heading towards Gladstone, you see them sitting on the side of the road grazing like cattle. Yeah. They're not frightened of cars, but they know to stay away from them. So, yeah. I mean, they're starting to realise, you know, motor cars hurt. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. You only have to be hit by them once. Mm. And, uh, it's a pity the cyclists the didn't think the same. <laughs> They've got more sense than them, obviously. <laughs> um, so, tell us about your first sighting anyway. When I lived at a little place at Sidmouth. I was um, finishing out my... Um, mechanical um, time at an engineering place at Bergensfield. And I had a little, I rented this little two-room shack at Sidmouth because housing was hard to get in those days of any sort. And of course, Byrne, a bit of a keen hunter, a bit of wannabe Daniel Byrne, I used to spend all my spare time just walking in the bush there hunting. Yep. And of course, then I got a job at Tempco and a mate, I won't mention his name because, you know, obviously... Yep. He he actually grew up in Campbelltown too, so he was fairly bush orientated. He used to come over every now and then. We'd go we'd go for a shot together. They were spotlighting together, you know. Yeah. And well, there was a waterhole back then because it's all changed now. It's all open ground now. It was a fairly good bush line all the way to the asbestos ranges. Yep. Down to Sidmouth, except for one little bit where they had to cross the road. Now, upon saying that, I'm not sure, but I think there might have been a water ditch under the road too. Okay. Which like is a in there. Pipe and, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, we're we're walking around this water hole, and I could hear this thing grunting. And um, of course, I put the spotlight on it. And I, I thought, what the, you know? 
what the F. <laughs> yeah. And um, I up with a shotgun. I was going to drop it, you know, being a young, sensible fella. <laughs> Yeah, as you do. And the other bloke stopped me. He said, "Christ, don't shoot that!" You know, he said, "That's a, that's a bloody Tassie tiger." He said, "You shoot that, they'll shoot, they'll hang you and draw and quarter you." Yeah. I said, "But they don't exist." He said, "Yeah, until you shoot one." <laughs> <laughs> so, what sort of distance was it? Thirty meters at best. And I'm, you were on one side of the water hole, and it was on the other. Yeah, and as we walked around the water hole, it cased us. It was following you. It was bloody hunting us, I think. Yeah, right. Eh? Mm, it was stalking us. Yeah. I mean, it's no different to if you were walking around the fence of a wrecking yard trying to break in and the and the guard dog of the wrecking yard. Yep. Well, the same. It's just stalking you. It was stalking us. Yep. And I mean, you know, we just quietly wandered off. <laughs> if you know and what I mean? Were you feeling a little bit intimidated by it at the time? No, because I had a gun. Okay, fair mm, enough. Mm. I was going to blast it. I was going to do an Elmer Fudd. <laughs> <laughs> Time uh, season. Yeah, I mean, well, young and silly, I, I pictured it skin hanging up on the wall, yeah, and look what I've got, but I mean, you know, the other bloke was older than me. And a bit and, more wiser. Yeah, and he, he, he stopped me. Yeah. And of course, he told me to keep my mouth shut, but being a young bloke, I didn't. I told the other fellas where I was working, and of course, they ridiculed the shit out of me over it. Sure, because mm. they're extinct. Yeah, of course they are, yeah. Yeah. Because you didn't shoot it and mm. come in with the trophy, you, you yeah. must have been drunk at the time. Yeah. Now, there was another gentleman I worked with at the time. He quietly said to me, I believe you. That's all he said. But he owned a property out this way. Okay. He bought it specifically to hunt tiger snakes. He had a bit of a fascination with tiger snakes. Okay. What, was he milking them for the venom or something? Or? No, he was eating them. Eating them? Mm. Okay. He brought them to work. Smoked tiger snake told everyone to smoke deal and everyone thought it was lovely until they I found out. smoke deal, it was pretty good. Until they realised I was eating tiger snake and then they were all out the back vomiting and carrying <laughs> on. <laughs> I thought it was quite nice, I, did, I didn't mind it actually. So yeah. when you saw this thing, I mean, you, you immediately knew what it was? You, you weren't in any doubt what it was? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look... You hear of all this crap, oh, we're not sure. I mean, I looked at that photo of yours, Neil. That's why I contacted you, because as soon as I seen that, yeah. This is the Joey? Yeah, yep. yeah, that was definitely Joey. Yeah. There was one other, I've seen other ones, but I'm, I'm not sure of. I, I, I'll be honest, I think aren't. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah. Absolutely. The one, one there galloping across the paddock, I looked down and I thought, no, it's not. Yeah, that one's got a, 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 my jury's never been fully in on that one either. No. That's the one with the lame front foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't think that is. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a bit of a look, and I thought, no, nah, no, nah, he's he's on the he's on the money here. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, this I, this one you saw was it very big? Yes, it was bloody huge. Okay. It was the size of a greyhound. Yep. But stockier built. Well, it had a set of teeth like an Afghan, if you understand what I mean. An Afghan dog. It had a big, big, long snout on it. Did it give you the yawn? No, it was grunting at us. Okay. And it was grunting. I think it was signaling... To others. Uh, to others. I mean, it's pretty obvious that they're ambush predator. Yep. And he, he'd, he'd come across us, but he needed backup. Okay. And he was calling for backup. Yep. You know? So you skedaddled. Well, shooting one might be a problem, but shooting half a dozen might be a real problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention... Well, I I only had a single shot, and me and my mate only had a twenty-two. Yep. So I mean, we might have had our work cut out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, thirty meters, a shotgun's still going to have an effect, but it might just annoy it. Oh no, 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 no problem at all, mate. Would have dropped it. That was an errant wrist, and it would have fucking bored hole, and I could put my hands through and shake the hands with the one behind it. Yeah, okay. That so would have been a pretty powerful it. shotgun. It would have blew it to fucking bits. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that thing was deadly to eighty meters. Yep. Hmm. I mean, okay. I could drop a Forester with that 60, 70 metres, no problem at all. Wow, that's pretty good for a shotgun. Yeah, well, it's an old shotgun, not a modern shotgun. Modern shotguns are just rubbish. Okay. Yeah. If it's got a chrome bore, it's, you might as well hang it off the front of your car for a fucking bumper bar, which is no good as a shotgun. Yeah, fair but enough. Them old ones will throw the bloody wads as far as what the modern shotguns will throw the shot. Yeah, okay, yeah. Hmm. But anyway, I mean, this is stuff you learn. And you know. what year was this anyway? You were a young fella, so what was it in the seventies, eighties? Yes, it was in the very end of the seventies, about seventy nine, eighty. Okay. Yeah. So, um 
not that long before extinction was officially declared in 1986. Yeah, I did read that and laughed <laughs> to myself. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, then it was about 81, 82 or 83, I'm not real sure now. It would have been 82, 83. I was working on a cray boat out of Bridport. Okay, yep. And I was driving an unregistered vehicle. I won't mention the vehicle because if I do, every bugger will know who I am. <laughs> Especially, and I was taking the back forestry roads. Okay. Because it Just was to stay away from the cops. Yeah, basically, yeah. They, they might have noticed it because it was still still had the 1960s number plates on it. So it was, was bit, an old one. Yeah, that was a bit of a giveaway. Sure. <laughs> Anyway, um, there was a gentleman called Buck Emberg made a thing about them. I know of Buck, I've never met him, but yeah. I know of him. Well, I seen a mother and two young'uns crossing near a bridge just down the road from where Buck Emberg said he'd seen them. Right, okay. And that was on a road that cut between Labrina and the uh, Bridport Highway, okay. which was a forestry road back then, but now it's a bloody great bitumen thing and sort completely changed. Yeah, sure. So it they won't be there track now. Back then. Yeah, uh, and the, the old vehicle being a generator lighting system, as I slow on down, of course, to go across this bridge, the lights are dimming. Yeah, yeah. And I, I spotted them. I mean, it, well, well, the vehicle's from the 1940s. Yeah. So, as it's you can imagine, car. Yeah. yeah, it's got, it's got reasonably, the brakes will stop you, but they're not great. Yeah, drum um, and drum. Yeah. So anyway, I'm on, the, I'm on the skids because I thought it was a, a dog at first. And then as I got closer to it, I realised, I thought, oh, shit. But they weren't nowhere near as big as that first one I've seen. Okay, so these, were, these were smaller. Yeah, the, the mother would have been, oh... Oh, I don't know what. The size of a probably a whippet dog. Yep. A little or a little bit bigger. Yep. But stockier. Yep. I mean, to be honest, at, at first I thought it was a whippet. Sure. Uh, but until I realised no. Nah. <laughs> you know, because it and then I seen the little ones and they sort of tapered down. The one was two thirds the size and one was half a size. So you had you you adamant that that was the mum? Because of the size of her compared to the first one you saw? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. she had a, a small young and a medium-sized young with her? Well, I'd say, the. well, I don't know if it's half-grown or what. Yeah. But she had two generations yeah. of joeys yeah. with yes. her? Yes, she had two generations with her, yeah. There was That's real. Yeah. And I sort of had a little smirk to myself and thought, oh, well, you know. They're breeding. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's the first time I've ever heard of a mother having two generations of young with her out of the pouch. Like, someone's actually seen two generations. Now, the Mullins ones, you would have seen the photos online of the three in the cage with the mother. Yeah. They were quite small when, when they were first captured. But yeah. old, old man Mullins, he knew how to look after them. And he hmm. got them to a, quite a healthy size. And if you see earlier shots of them they're you know just out of the pouch where, where, where does he come from i think he was out hobart way i couldn't tell you off the top of my head because there was, mar was, there was them. mullins is where i grew up too and they he was selling them to the zoos and stuff he was actually exporting them oh, right. so he was in the trade of, of of exporting them to melbourne zoo and a few other places i believe well, the, old the old fellow had the launceston zoo i can't think of his name now out at punch bowl dad knew him yep and uh, he, I'd heard them talking. He, he was pretty sure that he could get one if he needed one. Sure, okay. Mm. And that was in the nineteen seventies. And that would have been trapping, obviously. No, know. no, no. He knew, I think he knew someone would add a couple. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You got to remember, forestry protector, uh, parks and wildlife, or whatever they call themselves, fauna board. I think they're called in those days. Yeah. Protect everything except what they're supposed to protect. Yeah, they protect their interests rather yeah. than the animals. Yeah. yeah, my mate read a possum once, and he had hell from them assholes. Yeah, and they come to seize the possum, so he threw it at them. And after the possum was finished with him, it climbed back up on his shoulder, <laughs> and he said, "Dumb, <laughs> it can go." He said, "It's not a captive; yeah, it, can it can come and go as it puts." Yeah. yeah, he said, "But it doesn't want you here. Fuck off." Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's there's um, bureaucrats, and then there's bureaucracy, hmm. um, and yeah. But, if they spent less time at university, 
where um, imbeciles are, tr are training halfwits. Yeah. Because that's what I see. Most universities, imbeciles training halfwits. Yeah, there's there's a lot to be said about the academic world and how much they think they know and versus how much they do know. I think they follow what commented on your thing saying, you know, they got off their ass and got out and spent any time in the bush they might know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that that's across the board with a lot of it really. Mm. Um you know, we we I I come across academics regularly. Um but academia and science are two completely different things. Science is going out in the bush. Academia is basically writing papers, getting published, and, yeah. and hobnobbing about yourself. You oh know? yeah. Oh, well, I've been published. Like, I think the word is cock polishers. Well, yeah. Well, I wasn't going to say it, but yeah. <laughs> you've gone there. <laughs> yeah. That's what they are. Let's face it. Um, yeah. So you you saw this at what time of night was it when you saw this small family? Uh, it was just on dusk. Okay. Because it was that bad light, you know, when especially with older vehicles where just it's not dark but it's not daylight but you can't see a freaking thing. Yeah, I had an right old on. Volkswagen with a generator and I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's even worse because it's six volt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was pretty bad. Um, Yeah, so... So she she was crossing the road and, and they took off in the bush or they stopped? She she sort of basically stopped on their road and hurried them, if you know what I mean. I must say, um, where... It was more of a case of where the bloody hell did he come from? Okay, so she basically waited for them to get out of the way and then she followed them. Well, she caught, She was on the edge of the road and they was... I mean, I could have mowed the little fella down easy as anything. I mean, yeah. I nearly did, to be honest. Yeah. And um, she, she was... She'd gone into protection mode. Get over here. You know? Okay, and so they scarped across the road yeah. and they all took off. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I, I, sort of, so, I sort of sat there for a couple of seconds, rolled a smoke and thought to myself, I'll be back. <laughs> oh, well. And that was regeneration forestry in those days. Okay. Hmm. Before the age of the wood chip. And no, the, before the age of the winery. Oh, it's all okay. freaking wineries out there now. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you go up the hill coming out of Labrina, there's a road turns off to the left, takes you back to the Bridport Highway. Yep. That's the road. Yep. And about a mile into there, they used to come down the gravel hill across a little wooden bridge. Yep. And that's exactly where it was. That's not Piper's Brook Road, is it? I'm not sure what it's called now. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that was um, around about 1980. I can tell you exactly about 80, 82 that would have been. Okay. Yeah, it was about two or three months before Buck Emberg started tried, making noise. Tried to tried to tell people, look, you know, there's tigers out here, and they all made a get out of him. Yeah. I, I do remember saying to my mate, no, he's, he's right, I've seen one out there. Yeah. Well, I didn't say I'd seen a family, I said, no, I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing a video of Buck and Nick Mooney standing there interviewing him, and Buck had actually got plaster casts from around his dam. I wonder Buck didn't knock Nick Mooney on his ass. Well, you know, who knows what was said off Do you realise Buck Emberg grew up in the back blocks of um, America? No. I from, a fair, from a fairly hard existence, just quietly. and So he was a real bushman. Yeah. In his own right. Yeah, hang on. I'll give you a book to read. Alright. You can take home there. I've got ice score it and I'll talk myself. I know this joke, I'll um, read that. Well, I thought it was on thrones, but it's Ah, awesome. So this is about his life. Yep. Fantastic. Now, is is it am I right in that him and his wife now live on the east coast? I don't know. I I never. I actually met him once. So I can't remember what the circumstances were. Whether it was in my me field as a mechanic, or whether it was in my uh, uh, through someone else or something. I did meet him briefly. Yep. Maybe I met him at Peter Leach's. I'm not sure because I knew Peter. Yep. Through other. That would have been in the eighties as well, or into the nineties. No, 90s? that was into the nineties. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, but I didn't mind him. I mean, he was, he was a bit of a straight shooter. Yep. Yeah. I like people like that. Yeah. Well, was... Calls a spade a spade. If you didn't like your toe, you fuck off. Yep, you know? fair enough. Um, yeah. I discovered their website oh, probably about 10 years ago after I had my first sighting out here. Yeah. And um, it was called tazzytiger.org, I think, or tazzytiger.com. I can't remember, but there were some really good sightings on there. But uh, sadly, it's no longer there. It's been pulled down because they, they obviously stopped paying for the internet for it or whatever to host it. 
but there was some really good sightings on there back in the day. Um, a lot of them from up the sideling and then out that Fernie, Fernie Ridge Road as well, out past Golconda there. That goes out to the Bridport Road as well. Well, that, there's another thing too. You were that look out there at the sideline. If you sit there and with your ears pricked and listen to some of the noises in that bush. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a few sightings off the sideling road. Yeah. I mean, you can hear noises in that bush that aren't the norm. Yeah. That's all I'll say. I mean, if anyone's a bush person and they can re read the bush properly and know what the noises are and what animals make what noise, they'll be going, hmm? What the hell was that? What was that? Yeah. 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 No, that doesn't surprise me at all. There's um, a few stories about them coming off of Mount Barrow, and I remember Andrew mentioning to me a, quite a while ago that the ones that were seen out in the northeast were quite large. Mm. There, were, there was exceptionally big ones. Well, caught in the northeast. An old gentleman, I, he was like a grandfather to me. He was actually our landlord. Okay. And he came. He actually came from Ringarooma, originally. Yep. To Launceston, and he was, he was pretty switched on old fella, and he told me you put a pin, put a pin into the map and draw a forty mile radius. Right, so that's about sixty k's, sixty five k's. He said, and, he said, and look on it as a clock face. He said, one o'clock, right round to twelve o'clock. He said that's the twelve months of the year they'll hunt that area. Yep, and. I'd believe that fella over all the experts. I don't care who they are or what they think they know, but that old bloke knew his shit, and yep. he, he wasn't the sort would told to anything. If he he didn't know, he wouldn't say. Sure. And if he, he didn't know, he'd up. tell you. And if yep. he didn't listen, he'd tell you to get go yep. and get rooted. Yeah. You know, he was straight, straight dinky die old fella. Yeah. And um, that's what he said. He said, "Look at a clock." He said, "They hunt like a clock face." And they just move through the area. They move in that circle in a 12-month period. Yep. Well, you do get a lot of repeat sightings in the same spot a year later or two years Except later. That's or... what I said to you the other day. You, yep. If you see a sighting up here somewhere, you're wasting your time coming back two or three months later, you're not going to see it until about roughly... The... A year later. Yeah. Yep. Like that spot I'll take you to. Yeah. I've worked it out. It was just after Easter. Okay. Hmm. I've got a little surprise for you up there too when I take you up there. Okay. Yeah, yeah well... Um, there's a couple of things that... There's a spot there where I think you might like to put a camera. Okay, mm. fair enough. Um, so your second sighting, this this sighting, did you tell many people about it at the time or you just kept it to yourself? I, I think you mentioned you mentioned it to Buck. I might have mentioned it to him, yes. I, I, I'm not sure, though. I'm, or I might have said to him, look, mate, I know you're not full of shit because I've seen him there myself. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. I mean, you know, I didn't go into it big detail. Sure. Yeah. It was just something that you were happy about and you kept to yourself pretty mm. much. Well, a lot of them old bushmen used to say, just keep it yourself, boy. Let the poor buggers breed up. They've had it, had it bad enough as it is. Yeah. You know? That was the general consensus. A lot of them old bushmen felt like that. Yeah, because they know? saw the slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. I, like that fella down Hobart took his boy to show him where they were logging and, and his boy spotted one. The, and you could see by the look on the old fella's face, he doesn't even want to report it. Yeah. He, the boy, of course, wants to, but he doesn't want to. You see the old bloke sitting there, he just puts me mind on so many others and must say, oh, fuck them. Yeah. They don't want to know. They all think you're an idiot. Bugger them. Leave them. Let, let them be. Yeah, well, a lot of the time, you know, the... the the feedback that I get from sightings witnesses about the way the authorities handle their sighting report is pretty pretty average. They don't really want to know, or they don't believe them, or they just don't give a shit. Um, well, I tell you, tell you how good this is Ian Norton. I'll name the prick. I went up to the Launceston Museum. I lived in a place up at Trebellon, okay. and the scorpions used to walk around there, party all night on the floor to the stage we fried to get out of bed. Yep. And I told him about it, about the big black ones and the big red ones, and he laughed at me. They don't exist here in Tasmania. So I took him a black one and a red one, both in two Lego pickle bottles, which they just fitted in. They were that big. Hmm? And I dumped them on the floor in front of him. And I said, there you are, you cockhead, what are they? Call me a fucking liar. <laughs> I heard a similar story about galahs in Tasmania too, from national parks. 
They reckon glass don't occur in Taz, mate. It's too cold for them. <laughs> I've seen plenty of glass down here. <laughs> I know maybe, the maybe, are. maybe if they weren't driving around with a car full of glass. <laughs> they might see some. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I will say up here in the northeast. It's some very... I was a bit taken back by how primitive it is, wildlife-wise. Yeah, okay. I mean, you can go into Launceston Museum and you see a, a grey in there, and of course I've got paddy melons sitting out the front here bigger than the greys in the Launceston Museum, and they're paddy melons. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it's fair to say that different regional conditions affected the growth of animals differently, without a doubt. Yeah, I was only looking, everything's bigger up here. Yeah, I was only looking at um, some historical photos of thylacines in zoos, hmm. living ones, uh, only a few days ago, chatting to a few people online about it, and I noticed there is two distinct styles of rear ends on different specimens. Well, that's something I was going to mention to you too, that first big male I've seen. Yep. I firmly believe he was a different different type of thylacine to the mother and cubs I've seen. Yep. Well, that video that I put out a couple of weeks ago where I'm talking to Norma Baker, the uh, lady who's been doing fauna rescue for over 60 years. Where does she live? She's out in Port Way. I, I wonder if she's tied to the Bakers of Lefroy. I don't think she is. I think it's Baker by marriage. I don't think it's her maiden name. I think it's her married name. But... Um, the, um, the images I put in there, because I was, because everyone said that that first one in the photos was a paddy melon. Now I admitted right from the beginning that the mother and the father are ambiguous, but the joey is definitely not. That joey is absolutely a thylacine joey in my view. Right now we had the cat brigade come out who can't tell the difference between a marsupial and a cat, but that's fine. They can have their fantasy about cats. But that mother has got that long linear body and you can see she's got a broad head because her ear is right out near the side of her ribs. I didn't even give it a second look. I've seen the joey. Yeah. And, and well, what's a, what's a joey paddy melon doing? What's a joey thylacine doing hanging out with two paddy melons? Maybe just paddy make, melons adopted it. It just makes no sense, you know. <laughs> but when I was looking at... Now, Norma pointed out the rear legs on that female, the mother. And she said that's not a paddy melon hind leg because of the, the, the way the fur uh, ends abruptly rather than continuing down evenly all the way to the bottom of the foot. But it's got this fuzzy fur. Now, when I was having a look at some of these animals in the zoos, there was this one that I think it's a female and it's got this sh lower rear end and it's real stocky in the bum and broad, not skinny like that Benjamin one that was walking around in the video. And there's the fur, and it stops abruptly, and it was all bushy and sticking out. And I took one look at it, and I thought, that's just like that female in those photos we got. Only it's from a completely different angle, so you can't appreciate the actual look of the rear end. But it's got a really fat, stocky rear end that's quite low. Well, that's I just realised why I knew straight away why it was a thylacine. Because one of my pet, I've always been into antiques and things like that one of my being a poorer kid I didn't have a lot of money and you know I come from a reasonably poor area of Launceston and sure one of my greatest pastimes was spending time at the museum looking at stuff hmm. yeah and of course what was in the museum yeah two thylacines yeah so I, I knew them straight away now the ones in the museum they're the female one there that was about the size of that mother Okay, mm. not real big. Mm. Yeah. Now, the one I seen at Sidmouth was a lot bigger than them. Yeah. But it was still a thylacine. Yeah. But at first, at first I thought it was a big dog. I mean, you know, you, last thing you're going to be thinking of is, oh, you know, I'll go out for a shot and I'll bag a thylacine. Sure. I thought it was a big dog because of the grunting. And then I, when I realised it wasn't, I was a bit taken back by the fact that was, that was the first one I'd actually seen in real life. And it was so big. Mm. Yeah, it, it was a big bastard. Yeah, well, I do get lots of reports of people saying to me that it was as big as a German Shepherd or as big as a Greyhound. Or... It was very much... I used to walk Greyhounds as a kid. Yeah. For pocket money. Oh, yeah. 
some, some people work out who I am. And a big greyhound, not a little greyhound. Yeah. A big ma- a big dominant male greyhound was the size of this thing. Yep. And I mean, well, they talk about the thing. I mean, when a greyhound runs, it runs like a thylacine. I hate to tell them. Yeah. All these experts. You, I mean, a greyhound walks, but when it runs, it gallops. That's right. Hmm. That's so, right. so there's a dog what's very much like a thylacine. A lot of the early pioneers in Tasmania, when they described thylacines in motion, they, they used horse terminology because they knew horses. That was animal husbandry back in those days. A horse was mm. their tractor. So well, sir, they, they knew how a horse cantered or it trotted or it galloped, and that was how they described the thylacine's locomotion. It was mm. either cantering or it was galloping. You know? Well, I... Um I was a bit naughty, I suppose. There used to be an old tomcat used to sit on a fence and he used to torment the greyhounds. Oh, yeah. And I'd lose them 100 yards before, and they'd take to him. And they'd go flying down. He'd, he'd wait until they were just about breathing their breath on him and he'd hop down off the fence. <laughs> just to torment them a bit more. <laughs> but I guarantee you, I'd then go and, well, let's say I, I didn't bet. But somebody I knew put a bet on for me. Yeah, that dog would win. We had a whippet when I was a kid, and that thing used to bring home dead cats regularly. My brother was forever digging holes in the backyard, hiding cats and, and poodles and God knows what it used to kill. But you couldn't keep it in; it would go straight over a six foot fence, just like it wasn't even there. Straight over it and out, gone. Yeah, well, that was the funny thing. These grounds used to stop at the fence. I used to used to think to myself, "You stupid bastard! You should be able to jump that fence." It was only what. Five foot high at best, one of those. They would have cleared it in a flash. Federation wire type yeah, fences, yeah, you know, yeah. front fences. What they, them old, old Federation unity type houses had. Yeah, yeah which was very common. Well, you come from Adelaide, so I suppose there's still a lot of them out there. Yeah, there would be a few. Yeah. But the older part in of the older suburbs. The older sub. Well, I think in one of the older suburbs of Launceston. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I'd, I'd like to take you out here too because they're at, they're they're they're, they're definitely out here. Yeah. There's no two ways around it. I mean, I don't need an expert to tell me. I knew I knew that day. I got set upon by a five foot high grey, yeah. and he was a big grey, and he was terrified, absolutely terrified. He came out of the bush and it, he stopped because he nearly ran full butt into me in in my car. Okay. I won't mention what sort of car it is because that you were sitting in your car at the time. Well, I, I took the wrong road. Yeah, and I I just realised I thought, oh shit, <laughs> you know. And um, he looked at me as much as say, we need to get the f out of here. Yep. We're in trouble. Yep. It was almost like follow me. And what happened? Did did, did you hear anything? Oh yes, I heard him in the bush. Okay. I could hear him signalling them. And mm. were they yipping or were they grunting or? A bit of both. Okay. Mm. So but there was more than one there and they were communicating. Yeah, but they were a fair distance away from each other too. We weren't, we're not talking 10 or 20 yards away. I mean, they, they were circling him probably in a, in a half mile radius. Okay. And just keeping him on his toes. Wearing him down. Yep. Wearing him down, yep. Mm. And he was a, I mean, when you see a big native animal like that, which... Quite literally, if you come face to face with that, he'll rip your guts out. Oh, he's a big boy. When he was a big boy. Adult male kangaroos are Well, he's a, they're not formidable. a kangaroo. They're not a kangaroo. They're, well, a, they're a wallaby. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, they've been nicknamed a kangaroo. The only kangaroo we've got here is the forester. Yep. And all the rest are wallabies. But he was a big fella. Okay, yep. yeah. And he was the dominant male. He's obviously led them away from... From the rest of the mob. Mm. Yep. He's sacrificed himself. Yep. Which they will do. They they protect there, and so I suppose so does the thylacine. It's yeah, just their way. Yeah, yeah. But he he was he was scared. I mean, I've read kangaroo from hairless joeys. Yeah. Uh, my first wife. So I know, I know when one of those animals is. I I know a lot about them. Yep. Yeah. And he was scared. He was bloody terrified. And he was he was almost saying to me but looking at me as much as say we've got to get out of here yeah, you better yeah. come you better come with me we're in trouble <laughs> you know yeah. needless to say he's a bit surprised to run into me to start with yeah sure yeah. sure but he he wasn't what he was 
he was only, I could have walked, put me fist out the window and lifted him under the ear hole. That's how close to me vehicle he was. Yeah. So he, he wasn't giving me a second look. Yeah. You he, were the least of his problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was, he was scared, but not of me. Yeah. yeah. He could have took me out, he thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not uncommon to find adult male kangaroos in the Adelaide Hills or Victoria or just about anywhere on the mainland with their heads completely torn off yeah. and their lungs gone. They take them out through the neck yep. cavity. That's that's what I've been saying all along. The, I've, I've seen a lot of kill in the bush like that over the years. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And I mean, you know... It's very specific. And then I hear some half-wit say, oh, it's a quoll or a devil. If it's a devil... There'd be nothing left of it. Yeah. yeah. A devil is like a hoover. Yeah. If you was a hit man, you'd want to... You'd want to half a dozen devils in your backyard, just throw the corpse out the window. And they'll clean it up. It'll be gone next morning. Yeah. Yeah, what's that saying? You don't want to break your leg out there, devils will get you. That's pretty... I've heard that a few times in Tassie. <laughs> well, that young girl was murdered that time in Tasmania. The arsehole threw a body just up the top of Waverley. And they found it two or three days later. They only found part of it, though. Devils have cleaned her up. They were in the process of it, yeah. Yeah. And that's right on the city boundary. Yeah, Waverley's just right mm. on the edge. Mm. Yeah. Up above Prospect there. So it's probably only one or two devils. But they'll do it. Mm. Yeah. They, they were busy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that. Well, I suppose I can say it now because um, I was hunting with. He uh, used to be actually a Tasmanian police officer, but which I knew. And some other friends with dogs up in the back of um, Von Bibra's property at Ross. Yeah. And we shot two mounds of kangaroos. Yep. There was a fair group of us there. And we were quartering them. Okay. Now, so this was for dog meat or for human consumption? Both. Okay, yep. yeah. Um, oh, there was about eight of us all up, two carloads. Yeah. And um, we'd quartered one lot and there was a trailer load. Of, of front front quarters and skin and that you know just uh, you can picture the heap sure yeah i mean if you dump the yard of gravel on the ground that's what it looked like but it's you know and, yeah i understand it's... and we went probably we well, from here to that hall over there over to the next lot what was up around the corner sort of thing to to see how they were going but we'd done our lot and we'd packed it all away and that and yeah we get up there and um they got about the same, you know, so we, what's the name? And then we, we thought, well, we better chuck these carcasses in the trailer and take them and we'll put all the carcasses together somewhere, you know, do, trying to do the right thing. Yeah, keep it tidy. Yeah, keep it property. tidy. You don't want shit laying everywhere, you know, find a hole and chuck it all in or something, you know. Yeah. Well, when we got back, the first lot were gone. Nothing. Not a thing there. Dragged off. Just gone. Yeah. Just like um, someone had come along with a big vacuum cleaner and sucked it all up. Oh, I mean, I was only, oh, I sort of, it was a bit, a bit buggered, you know. Like that, yeah. And um, I, I said to Bob, well, you just say Bob, um, what the bloody hell happened there? He said, well, he said, what hope would you have? He said, if you were wounded in the bush, he said, they're pretty efficient, them devils, aren't they? He said, that's the devils. I said, well, he said, the little buggers have been in the bush everywhere just waiting. Yeah, because they know what you're doing. Yeah. They know a free feed when they yeah. see it. Yeah. He said, yeah. And they sense the smell would be brilliant too. They could yeah. smell death. His exact words were they like wo they were like wogs with teeth. Something for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. All right, mate. Well look, I really appreciate you having a chat to me. It's um been very enlightening and uh I do enjoy the uh the old historical stories as well and mm. clearly um this incident that you just mentioned before with the with the uh, with the wallaby looking quite fearful. That wasn't that long ago, obviously. No. That was only a, a year or so ago. It's almost time again for them to be back in that area. Yeah, yeah. I think they move out to the coast a bit during summer. There seems to be a few sightings out towards the coast in summer. Mm. Um, not all of them would. <coughs> There'd obviously be some that stay closer inland because they just don't need to cross each other's path. Well. They seem, be, this is something, they seem crazily hunting them on the west coast all the time. And I mean, with respect, there's bugger all animals 
in the bush there because the bush is too heavy. Yeah. So there's a if lot there's, of bug, out here. there's bugger all animals, there's bugger all thylacines for the same reason because they, they follow the food chain. That's it. They're going to follow the game. Hmm. I yeah. mean, it's no good. It's no good at parking outside an, an, a closed down supermarket to get your groceries, is it? No, that's it. Makes mm. perfect sense. The west coast. The west coast is. There's some place there. You, you walk on top of, uh, two to three meters on top of the fucking brush. Yeah. And if you fall through it, you're in all sorts of shit. Yeah. Well, if you can't get it, uh, animals can't either. Yeah. But the only thing that lives on the west coast would be fucking snakes. Well, a lot of people say to me, you know, why don't you go down the southwest? That's where they'll be. Well, the southwest is it's, it's, a boggle, and it's you know, you break an ankle in there, you are in big trouble because it's it's um, not exactly populated, um, and you'll be getting airlifted out of there with a helicopter just to get out of there. You know. Well, just up the road here, I won't name it, but I mean, there could be one sitting in the middle of that plane. In plain sight, you wouldn't see him unless he moved. Yeah. Because they're camouflaging. Yeah. I mean... Those sags make very good camouflage for him. I mean, there was an ad on telly. There was a Australian soldiers coming up, camouflaging, coming up, popping up and off they go again. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. wouldn't see him. Yeah. That's what camo... I mean, that's what camouflage is. If if people were to get past the mindset of um, stupidity. Yeah. Something was camouflaged. He's not. He's not walking around with a flashing red light on his head. That's right. Yeah. And he's yeah. camouflaged for a reason. Absolutely. You don't want to be seen. Well, he doesn't want you to know he's there because um, if you know he's there, so does the the game what he's trying to eat. That's right. Yeah. Those stripes are on him for a reason. Mm. They're not raisin stripes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, Look forward to publishing this and getting your story out there. We we need to go for a drive too. All right, do you we'll want? do that. Yeah.